National Adaptation Forum webinar, Adaptation in the City, focusing on how communities are adapting to a changing climate, highlighting efforts in Detroit and Brooklyn. This webinar is sponsored by EGRADAP, the National Wildlife Federation, Detroit is Working for Environmental Justice, and EPRAS, and hosted by CAKE. My name is Alex Kaur, a scientist with EGRADAP, and I will be moderating the webinar today. The National Adaptation Webinars are held quarterly, so we continue discussing how to move adaptation forward. This was as a result of the first inaugural National Adaptation Forum in Denver back in 2013. If any of you would like to recommend a topic or are interested in partnering and co-hosting a webinar, please email me at alex at ecoadapt.org. But before we get started, I would like to go through some housekeeping rules to ensure we have a successful webinar. Please place telephones, cell phones, and computers on mute. This will help reduce the feedback. If you're using the microphone voice over IT option, please ensure you place your computer on mute, even if your list is as, as muted when you log in. We will have plenty of time after presentations for question and answers throughout the webinar. You can use a function to submit questions to presenters. I'm good now. I'm good. Post. We will do our best to answer all of them. You can also raise your hands and we will call on you and then meet you to ask a question directly. You can also use a chat function to report any technical difficulties or problems you might be encountering. So again, everybody, please place on mute. We just heard, you know, some background um, feedback. The chat function can also be used to communicate between attendees as ways to emphasize a point heard during the presentation. We encourage you to engage with your fellow colleagues that way. Finally, I wanted to let you know that we will be recording and posting the webinar in the EcoDeck and, and Cake website for future viewing. They should be available online by next week and can be viewed at ecoadapt.org and at the cakex.org website. Presentations will also be available as a PDF in EcoAdapt website at ecoadapt.org forward slash webinars. Without further ado, I will introduce Kara Reeves from the National Wildlife Federation, which is currently in another meeting and over books, but has taken some time to be with us during the first part of the webinar today. And she will be introducing um, our speakers as well. Kara manages the National Wildlife Federation Climate Smart Communities Program, which helps communities identify the use of nature-based approaches to prepare for impact of climate change and has just completed a new primer on nature-based adaptation approaches to urban adaptation called Green Works for Climate Resilience, a Community Guide of Climate Planning. Um, Kara, you're on. Next slide. Yes, I'm here. Next slide, please. And I assume you can hear me too, right? <laughs> we can hear you. You sound great. Okay, fantastic. So um, thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you also just to EcoAdapt for your partnership on this webinar and also your leadership in the adaptation community and for your partnership with us throughout the years. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, National Wildlife Federation is a conservation organization with over 4 million members and supporters. And uh, several years back, we identified climate change as the greatest threat facing wildlife. And the approach that we're taking to tackle the climate change challenge is one that focuses on both uh, the root causes of climate, addressing the root causes of climate change, also known as climate change mitigation, um, as well as helping people and wildlife uh, prepare for and respond to the impacts of climate change, which those of you on the webinar sure, I'm sure know it is also called climate change adaptation. And um, this dual approach that we're taking is actually um, quite similar to and uh, mirrors the approach that we're increasingly seeing uh, many cities and towns across the country take, um, including uh, Detroit and, and also in New York. Um, as Alex mentioned, um, I mentioned, I manage the Climate Smart Communities Program. And um, uh, I actually, uh, you know, also recently just uh, completed a guidebook so that the slide that you see right now is a promo um, for this new resource that I encourage you all to um, take a look at it. It's a, a primer on uh, nature-based approaches, um, and it includes some um, rich examples from um, communities across the country and descriptions of the, the efforts that they're taking. 
Um, and just as a, an aside, for those of you not familiar with nature-based approaches, um, those include efforts to enhance, protect, and restore uh, natural systems like coastal wetlands and tree canopies, as well as uh, features that mimic natural processes like rain gardens and, and green roofs that are used in stormwater management. And so I encourage you to um, take a look at this new resource. Um, and I, you know, I've been working with uh, cities and towns on, on climate change for a number of years now. And I'd say for the most part, um, the climate um, planning activities um, that I've seen have really been initiated by and um, and carried out by local government, you know, through mayor's offices and departments of the environment and sustainability offices. Um, um, however, uh, with support uh, from the Kresge Foundation, um, Andrew Leoff was able to host a scholarship program uh, for local leaders to attend the National Adaptation Forum last year. And when we were reviewing applications, um, two in particular stood out. Um, and of course, when I met these women and uh, learned more about their work, um, they stood out even more. Um, both Kimberly and Elizabeth are leading efforts that are community-driven, uh, which makes their work not only unique in the adaptation space, in my opinion, but also very powerful. Uh, and today, we're going to hear about their work in Detroit and Brooklyn, uh, respectively. Uh, so Kimberly Hill Knott um, has a bachelor's um, for the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and a master's in educational administration from Chapel University. Um, she's currently the Director of Policy at Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice. And in uh, 2011, uh, Kimberly convened several stakeholders from diverse backgrounds to form the, to form the Detroit Climate Action Collaborative. Um, through the collaborative, um, she's facilitating the development of the Detroit's first comprehensive climate change action plan. Um, she was recently nominated and selected for the White House Champions of Change Award. Um, and was also one of 100 women invited to participate in the White House Women's Summit on Climate and Energy. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Yampier is a nationally recognized Puerto Rican attorney and environmental justice leader of African and indigenous ancestry, born and raised in New York City. Um, she's executive director of UPROSE, Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization, and she's a longtime advocate and trailblazer for community organizing around justice sustainable development, environmental justice, and community-led adaptation and community resiliency in Sunset Park. Um, she holds a, a bachelor's from Fordham University, a law degree from Northeastern University, and is the first Latina chair of the U.S. EPA National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Laura Hansen um, is a, has a PhD and is a chief scientist and executive director for EcoAdapt. Um, Laura thinks climate change is everybody's problem, and she wishes someone would bother to do something about it. And so her desire for action is what led her to create EcoAdapt with a team of similarly uh, minded folks um, back in 2008. Uh, she's the co-author of many of the earlier texts on the issue of natural systems adaptation, uh, including a recent book called Climate Savvy, Adapting Conservation and Resource Management to a Changing World. And the team that created these books um, created an engaged stakeholder process um, to help resource managers create adaptation strategies um, applicable to their work. Uh, so as you can see, we have a really um, phenomenal uh, uh, panel of women to speak today, and I know that um, their remarks, and when you learn more about their work, um, it, will, it will definitely inspire you, and I, I know that we'll have a productive and inspiring conversation after their presentation. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kara. Um, and without further ado, um, Kimberly Hill Nutt. Okay, thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, it, it's certainly an honor to participate in this exciting and timely discussion. So Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice is the oldest environmental justice organization in the state of Michigan. We were founded in 1994, and so we are celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And I will just open up uh, with our, um, our vision statement. Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice champions local and national collaboration to advance environmental justice and sustainable redevelopment. We foster clean, healthy, and safe communities through innovative policies, education, and workforce initiatives. Next slide. And so Detroiters work in DWEJ is the name that I'll, the acronym that I will use. Um, 
we believe that it was our mission to develop a climate action plan. And so we understood and working in this arena that there were many challenges that um, kind of made us really look at whether the time was right to develop this this particular plan. And so in 2011, we convened a group of stakeholders from diverse backgrounds. It was maybe only 11 or 12. And we talked about the feasibility of doing it. And the reason we did that is because our government, local government, was in flux. Um, we were going, uh, had maybe two or three ma mayors within a very short period of time, and so we were having some challenges. And so we wanted to talk about whether we should even move forward with this type of initiative. And after much discussion, we decided to uh, launch uh, the effort, and so we launched in 2012. And the Detroit Climate Action Collaborative is a very diverse coalition of people um, that have been committed over the years to addressing the issue of climate change. One of the other reasons that we were uh, we felt that it was um, kind of our responsibility to do it is because Detroit has five of the most toxic zip codes. So the most toxic zip codes in the entire state are actually located right in the city of Detroit. And the most toxic zip code is 48217. And so when we looked at developing a climate action plan, we believed that it would have many coal benefits, um, and that would be in addition to reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. So we have two goals. Our goals are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the sustainability and well-being of the city, as well as to increase the resilience of the city's social, built, and natural um, environments. Uh, the, what's going on in Detroit, many of you know, we're under um, an emergency manager that kind of handles the finances and, and the operations of government, even though we, have, we still have a mayoral and a city council, city council structure that is in place. But um, Detroit is, is really a renaissance city, and so our push has been you cannot develop the city of Detroit without having a sustainability component. In fact, we believe that that must be the major component as you're talking about uh, the redevelopment of the urban, the main urban center in the state of Michigan. Next slide. And so uh, this has been a very uh, lengthy process. Um, but it has been an exciting process, and the reason that it has been lengthy is because we have really taken our time to make sure that um, just about all of the, the main bases are covered when dealing with the Climate Action Plan. And I should say that who helped us, there were several people who helped us through this process, and so uh, we have the city of Detroit uh, that's on board, but we also went outside of the city and outside of the state to talk to others, and so we talked to Adam Freed, many of you may know him, uh, who provided a great deal of information, um, who was, I think, the uh, main leader on the plan NYC under Mayor Bloomberg. We've also been consulting with Sustainable Pittsburgh, uh, Matt, who has been uh, just a phenomenal resource for us, and we will continue to work with him as we further develop our business component. Okay? Next slide. And so these are some of the stakeholders that we have. Um, I won't read through all of them, but you can see that it's very diverse. We have um, environmental organizations. We have academia. Um, we had community as well as uh, city government. And we believe that uh, this is the type of um, group that you need to have. And they also serve on our steering committee um, to really develop a, a robust program. Next slide. These are additional partners who are uh, part of our work groups, which we will talk about a little bit later. And so you'll see we have industry on there. We have government on there. We have individual businesses on there. We have the city of Detroit. We also pulled in state government as well. Next slide. One of the things I should say that we do, um, that we did, and actually you can go back to the previous slide before this, the one with the pictures, with the partners, work group partners. 
So one of the things that we did, um, being an EJ group, um, and it was a very fine line that we walked in, I'll talk a, a little bit more about that uh, when we get to the obstacle section, is that we uh, decided to bring in um, industry and, and other large corporations. And one of the reasons that we decided to do that is because we believe that the people uh, or the entities that were really contributing to the, the problem should be at the table. And so we brought them to the table early on in the process. Okay, next slide. Now, these pictures are very telling. Uh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, and it kind of shows the various aspects of, of climate change. One picture, you see the flooding. Another one, you see the man who's so hot, he's, you know, kind of uh, wiping his, his forehead. Uh, and then you see uh, the, the storm water, the issue with the water going into the uh, sewer. And then you see all of the industry. And so we're dealing with all of that. We have a combined sewer system. Um, in the city of Detroit, which in 2011 dumped 29 billion gallons of partially treated and untreated um, sewage into our Detroit lake. That's an issue because um, many people fish, uh, African Americans and low income, uh, 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 people from low income communities actually uh, use that water as a source of food because they fish regular, regularly. Okay, next slide. Okay, so some of the obstacles. Um, one of the things that you want to do is put together the right kitchen cabinet. Now, those of you in the political arena uh, would be very familiar or, or should be very familiar with that term. Your kitchen cabinet are your closest advisors, and they're not necessarily uh, the stakeholders. Um, which is typically, um, or your working group, Those are that's typically a larger group. But your kitchen cabinet are the ones that you bounce ideas off of. Um, they are the ones that bring ideas to you and kind of give you um, the critical um, advice that you need. And they give it to you from a, uh, an un, uh, can give it to you from an unbiased um, perspective. So that's important. You do not need to have yes people around you all the time. You need to have people that will challenge you and people that will um, effectively um, and genuinely challenge um, some of the uh, programs that uh, are, are concerns or recommendations that you bring to them if needed. Not to be contrary, but you know, at least you'll have that other perspective. And it took a long time to bring these people to the table because, interestingly, many of the people who are serve on our steering committee are not people that I had relationships with before, um, which is interesting. So we kind of went outside of the box and brought some new people to the table. And so it's amazing um, how diverse uh, our reach is even in Detroiters working for environmental justice. I should also say that the Detroit Climate Action Collaborative is an initiative of Detroiters working for environmental justice. So anyway, just make sure you have trustworthy people at the table. So I kind of overcame it by um, just working with them and kind of building that relationship. And so that's how I uh, kind of came um, overcame, I should say, the fear of making sure I had the right people at the table. Okay, so building trust among the stakeholders and long-term commitment. I cannot emphasize this enough. And so now what you have to do, and we've had some people who have dropped off. Um, we have been meeting since 2012, and so to get a group to stay together that long is phenomenal. And so um, – what you want to do is just make sure that you actually um, bring them on early in the process so that you are able to um, build that trust and actually they will feel uh, that they're part of the program. And so then you'll have buy-in when it comes time, when it comes, when you are ready to ask for a commitment. So our commitment is for our business leaders in particular and others, including uh, the municipality, uh, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and so giving them a target. Okay, raising money and leveraging resources. Um, this has been the most interesting but yet rewarding obstacle. It's been uh, kind of difficult because I think it's um, – a trust issue, are we able to do it? Is a nonprofit organization able to do it? And it's sad that people, I think, have that um, 
that that's an issue or a question, um, but it is. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And, and as I talk to people who have um, uh, initiated a climate action plan at the uh, uh, um, mayoral level, at the city level, um, they certainly have challenges, but not nearly as many challenges as, as we have had in this particular area. What's been the good thing, though, is that we've been able to use the resources that are at the table. And so people have just um, really made a lot of, uh, contributed a lot of in-kind donations. And so we continue to receive that. And, and because of this effort, we're continuing to receive um, national and even international attention. Okay, next slide. So these are just some of the, uh, I'll go over this really quickly, some of the key steps to establishing an effective adaptation plan. And one of them is that you must have, a, I think it, it, it just makes sense to have a greenhouse gas inventory. So we conducted two. We had one at the municipal level and we had one at the community level. We partnered with the University of Michigan to do the greenhouse gas um, inventory. Uh, you also want to make sure that your your ask is very clear, and so when you're working with the uh, working excuse me when you're working with different stakeholders, make sure that you have um, clear guidelines for how to proceed. Now, sometimes those guidelines may change. Uh, people may change. Sometimes people drop off. They get new jobs or whatever the situation uh, is. But you got to keep it together. Um, keep the group together regardless of what happens because you do not want the work to stop, uh, especially after you've gotten so far in the process. Make sure that your um, partners are very, very diverse. That's what we've learned and that's what we're continuing to uh, bring people to the table and particularly with our sector-based meetings. So we want to hear from as many people as possible, including the residents. So one of the things that we did is we have, um, we conducted five focus groups. Okay, next slide. So uh, climate change uh, it presents some interesting challenges for the business sector. Um, one of the things that we did is we actually had each work group, including businesses and institutions, um, develop adaptation and mitigation goals as well as uh, short-term and long-term action steps. So again, that's um, making sure that they're part of the process. And what we've learned through the research is that it, it, you know, it, for businesses, a lot of times, if it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense. And so we also had to emphasize the financial value of, uh, the, of reducing their energy usage. And so there are many things that a business community can do, and so we're um, working with them to uh, iron out some of those recommendations. And so um, you'll see also there's research showing that the more uh, uh, sustainable businesses are, uh, the more uh, likely they are to um, outperform their, their competitors and, and, and attract more consumers to their products. Okay, next slide. Okay, so examples of adaptation practices, I can't release that information right now because we're really um, just, we're still in the final uh, stages of refining uh, those adaptation uh, strategies. And so as soon as that is done, if there is another opportunity, we can uh, share that information. Okay, next slide. I would say, um, so one of the, our homes and neighborhoods work group uh, will work closely with the neighborhood uh, the office, the City of Detroit Neighborhood Office, and that will, will be good. We'll also, we are also looking to develop a neighborhood toolkit, and I understand that there have been several that have been developed as a part of um, climate action plans throughout the city, uh, throughout the states. And so um, there are many, many issues that uh, pertain to city, uh, particularly looking at transportation and infrastructure. And so there are a lot of opportunities. One of the things that we will be doing um, is we will be uh, partnering. Uh, the chair of that work group is uh, from the U.S. Green Building Council. And so we're looking at doing a pilot smart neighborhood 
project where we will actually retrofit some of the homes and we'll do a, a, a comprehensive energy audit, uh, uh, retrofit some of the homes, and then it will also be an educational tool for the children that we're going to bring in to have them do some modeling, as well as for the homeowners because we're also going to have an education component. Okay, next slide. Okay, and this is just a little bit more about uh, the community and the importance of um, the community engagement, education and community engagement. Next. Okay, and these are all of our work groups, solid waste, homes and neighborhoods, parks, public space and water infrastructure, energy, community public health impacts, and businesses and institutions. Okay. And again, all of those work groups develop adaptation and mitigation goals as well as short-term and long-term action steps. Now, what was really cool, again, we um, decided to do a municipal and a community-wide um, uh, greenhouse gas inventory. And we modeled that um, after uh, Plan NYC and a few other cities that did the same thing. We just didn't want to have it at the municipal level, particularly with the city that has so much industry. Next slide. Okay, and so this is um, indicator development. So we will, um, uh, the vulnerability assessment, uh, we did um, develop a vulnerability of uh, report that we partnered with the University of Michigan to, to, uh, to do for us, which highlighted or showed uh, heating, excessive heat, and flooding. And we also uh, did an indicator development. So each of these work groups have also developed indicators. Next slide. Okay, last but not least, these are just all of our accomplishments. Um, of course, we've, you know, met with the city of Detroit. We've met with this mayor. We actually started under Mayor Bing, um, started talking about it under Mayor Bing. And so um, uh, we are very proud of our accomplishments. We're uh, excited about the draft climate ordinance, ordinance that has been developed by Wayne State University Law School. So you'll see we have a diversity of partners, and we love our academic institutions as well as our other um, stakeholders because we believe that teamwork makes the dream work. That's all. If you have any questions, you can feel free to email me or call me. And that's great. And we've already been receiving a couple questions, Kimberly, but um, I think we're going to hold off questions and discussion after our next um, after our next presentation. Um, without further ado. Um, Please um, welcome Elizabeth Yampierre from UpRose. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Kim. It's really great hearing you and also hearing about uh, Plan YC 2030. I served on um, on the Sustainability Advisory Board for Mayor Bloomberg, oh, and it was wow. yeah, and it was there working with Adam Fried that I learned that uh, New York City had a 90 percent chance of experiencing a storm surge, mm -hmm. and that was and that was years before Sandy. Um, can I um, can I actually do the um, move the slide myself? All right, um, thank you. We, <laughs> All right, we were we okay. were having a couple of difficulties with um, okay. go to webinar today. So um, today I think we're just going to use the um, next slide version because it's being a little glitchy, and I apologize okay. for that. Okay, no problem. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, Uprose is is based in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn uh, Uprose is uh, the oldest Latino community-based organization uh, in Brooklyn. It will turn 50 in about a year and a half. Um, it's based in a community that is a working waterfront community um, in the largest significant maritime industrial area in New York. Um, and what that means is that that's where uh, a lot of the industry that serves New York City is, and it was cited there long before there was an EPA. Uh, so that's a big issue for us. We are an intergenerational, multiracial, uh, multi-ethnic uh, organization um, that addresses a variety of environmental justice issues. Uh, that's really important because that make that has made it really possible uh, for us to address a lot of um, the work that we're doing right now in mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Um, we are home to the Gowanus Expressway, power plants, brownfields, waste transfer stations, 
we have high rates of asthma, upper, uh, upper respiratory disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, all of the illnesses that one would associate with living in proximity uh, to a host of environmental burdens. Um, we address these public health disparities by facilitating meaningful community engagement on a variety of issues. It could be open space, where we have, through a community engagement, doubled the amount of open space in our community. Um, last year, we were able to, through our transportation initiative, expand a median on 4th Avenue. Uh, learned yesterday that um, the, the median has resulted in a decrease, uh, a 30% decrease in accidents. And, and that median was expanded uh, to increase pedestrian um, access and to make it more walkable. So these are environmental justice initiatives that actually contribute to our ability to build resilience. Uh, on the area of air quality, we've worked with our young people um, to, to monitor uh, air quality and we've also gotten our businesses to reduce net emissions by retrofitting uh, their facilities. Um, we do that through education, through intergenerational leadership training, uh, through cultural expression, and through transformative organizing, which we think is extremely important. Next slide. So as you can see here, we do any number of things. Down there you're going to see uh, the picture of the median that was expanded. Uh, we just recently restored a bu our, our bus line for our elders. Um, that's just one of the initiatives that make it possible uh, for our community to have access to mass transit. Um, another effort that reduces emissions. Uh, because we're intergenerational every year, we have the New York City Climate Justice Youth Summit. Uh, last year, the summit brought together 750 young people from all over the city. Um, this year's event, we hope, will bring about 1,000 young people, and there is a possibility that Mayor de Blasio will be uh, our keynote speaker. Last year was Melissa Mark Verrito. This is an effort to try to get our young people, young people who come from frontline communities to learn about climate change and what they can do locally. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, thanks. Uh, so if you look at the map, uh, the, the actual map that you see there isn't very readable, but if you look at the legend, uh, the legend includes facilities. Sunset Park runs from 15th Street to 65th Street and from 8th Avenue to the waterfront. And as I mentioned before, it's the largest significant maritime area in New York City. Um, it also, in that area, houses marine waste transfer stations, two super funds, chemical bulk storage facilities, a major oil storage facility, uh, a variety of sites that are under the toxic release inventory, and some land-based transfer stations. So that you can imagine that in the case of a storm surge, that all of those chemicals that are uncontainerized uh, because they were, this, this, this uh, area was created before there was even an EPA, uh, will spill out into our community. And in fact, that did happen. Uh, it happened in Red Hook and it, it happened in parts of Sunset Park. And so we have been working really hard uh, to make sure that the waterfront is climate adaptable because it is the largest walk to work community in New York City and as part of the EJ communities uh, we believe that manufacturing retention, industrial retention is important because our communities need to have a place to work. Uh, but if you look at the map you can see that this is a mixed use zone where our communities are living right in the middle of industry and are sometimes neighbors with you know uh, an auto salvaging shop. It is a community of color, largely Latino, Asian, uh, Middle Eastern, uh, and predominantly low income. Next slide. So in response to Sandy, uh, we've been working on all of these issues that I mentioned earlier, everything from open space to brownfield remediation for many, many years. And one of the things that we learned about this process is that resilience is not built overnight, that it happens over time as relationships deepen and people have an opportunity to build something together, solve problems together, address social injustice together, or even celebrate difference together through the arts. And that organizations with deep roots in the community, um, faith-based organizations, schools, small mom and pop shops, shops are really the anchors of resilience. One of the things we've been seeing is that um, what we believe is that a bottom-up approach is what is going to work in our community. In Sunset Park in the last five years there have been 
two tornadoes. If you can imagine two tornadoes in Brooklyn, uh, it's unheard of. A microburst, flooding, recurring blizzards, Hurricane Irene, Superstorm Sandy, and heat waves. We've used all of these terrible incidents that have taken place in our community as a way of organizing our community that often works two or three jobs, and the last thing they want to do is participate in a meeting. And so they've come to us, and they've said to us, after Sandy, we want to do more than change the light bulb. We want to basically drive um, a plan that is going to make it possible for us to survive the changes uh, that are coming to New York City and, and, and thrive economically at the same time. And so because we feel that the process of building, researching, learning, planning, and even installing adaptation uh, builds resilience, we, create, we were able to create a number of things from listening to the community um, that have become projects that the community has taken ownership of. of. Uh, we've used videos so that we can educate people on how to build storm mortar barrels. We've assessed how much it's going to cost to paint rooftops white. Um, and we have, uh, if you go to the next page, uh, what we have is, Oh, it's, it's actually the page after. That's okay. So through, through our organizing uh, and through all of our different programs, what we've done is a block-to-block -block, uh, climate um, justice center that really uh, provides this, has created this climate justice hub that brings together a multiplicity of stakeholders to identify what the solutions look like block by block. Next page, please. So... In New York City, any given block can have hundreds of people living there. And it could have a bodega, it could have an auto salvaging shop, it could have residents, it could have a barber shop. So the idea was not to come up with a cookie cutter approach that would exclude community and where community would have to react or respond to recommendations that were being made by experts. The idea was to create, and one of the things that we're doing right now, is to uh, recruit and train what we call the Community Climate Justice Corps. That core is made up from people who live on each of these blocks, and each of these people is identifying what they think should be the climate ad adaptation solutions for their block. And so those solutions can be different block by block. Uh, we have been able to uh, create a list of uh, adaptation methodologies that are affordable, that are accessible, and that make it possible for people to put something on the ground um, and in that process of doing that, build their relationships with each other. And, and the, the really cool thing about it is that uh, it makes it possible for each block to look, to look different from every other block and the solutions are that localized. We take into this process into account the fact that people in our communities come from different ethnicities, different races, that some have suffered from historical trauma. A lot of the focus on climate, for example, has been on just reducing carbon. Um, that's not necessarily often a priority for our communities that are living in the midst of environmental burdens. For them, addressing issues like co-pollutants and the kind of toxics and toxicants that they have historically been exposed to are really important. The other thing that's important is really recognizing that these communities aren't being exposed to this for the first time, but they have been exposed to it over generations, that these are people that over generations have had access to the worst food, the worst health care, and the worst, live, live, uh, the worst living conditions. And so they are particularly susceptible to disease. So to just give you a small example of one of the things that we've done, we've created a little card that people carry that tells a first responder what their blood type is, um, what, what medication they're on, um, whether or they have diabetes, so that if anyone responds to an emergency, they will be able to immediately know what that situation is with that person. That block captain, that person who's part of the Climate Justice Corps, is the person who knows who's on dialysis, who's on a respirator. You know, every block in every city has that one busybody, that person who knows everybody's business. To us, that's a natural organizer, and that's someone who can help create adaptation and resilience on the block. And in fact, it's turned out that the majority of women and the majority really do know what's happening on a very local level, what is happening on their block. And they're very excited to be working with their neighboring mom and pop shops to come up with solutions that are very localized, not just to reduce carbon, but to address uh, resiliency. Um, 
and in and while all of this is happening, of course, um, none of this happens in a vacuum. You have to work with city DOT, you have to work with the Department of Planning, you have to work with a variety of agencies um, which are not always accessible um, to communities and don't always speak the same language. So what UpRose does is we've created a glossary, we're creating a training program that really levels the playing field so that when the community comes in to meet with these agencies, not only are they speaking the right language, but they know how to make the right ask. What that means is that you don't go before the Department of Environmental Conservation and ask them to help you with your, you know, with the potholes. You know how to make the right ask. Um, that kind of local education makes it possible to develop uh, a really sophisticated citizenry that knows where funds are, how are they, how are they um, accessible, and what they can do to basically make their blocks um, adaptable. We also have some really big projects. Uh, one is an upland connector where we've partnered with the, the Department of Transportation to connect the working waterfront to the middle of the community using climate adaptation methodologies, everything from bioswales to taking uh, lights out of the grid and making them run by winds and solar. Those are some of the recommendations. And that's part of the transportation work that we're doing. Uh, we think transportation is the heart of sustainability and that making sure that our communities are walkable and that they have access to everything that they need uh, also helps in building um, and building um, uh, sustainability and making our communities adaptable and making them resilient. Next. Next. Slide. Okay. So this picture really sort of tells the story about Ebros. Um, in this picture, you see uh, an intergenerational group of people planning, doing mapping, uh, responding uh, to Sandy, uh, doing cleanup. Uh, there are pictures of our children who are in third and fourth and, and fifth grade who are learning how to do GIS mapping and are learning about environmental assets and amenities. Uh, our elders are part of this conversation as well. Um, these kinds of gatherings for us are really sort of the heart of how you build a community that is adaptable and resilient. Um, taking the knowledge from, uh, from the folks on our staff who are experts, breaking it down and making it accessible at a grassroots level um, is what we think needs to happen. One of the things that we often say is that if, God forbid, there's another disaster in New York City, we don't know whether the city will have the resources or the time to respond to all of our communities. And so people on the ground really need to be able to have the resources to be able to do this for themselves. Um, just last week, uh, I visited Trinity Lutheran Church uh, in our community. Uh, uh, Corinna Gore, Al Gore's daughter, was invited to talk about uh, faith and, and climate change. And, and after I had presented for about 20 minutes, um, uh, the congregants asked, well, can UPROS help us do these things? And we said, well, we can help facilitate a process where you will have all the information and all the materials so that you can decide what your climate action plan looks like. And so the idea is to use the Climate Justice Center, which was funded by Kresge, and we're so proud that they have supported us in doing this ground this groundwork. The idea is to be able to identify churches, institutions, small businesses that are willing to come together, work collectively, and work in, and, and create non-traditional partnerships, but really look at their own resources and find out how they can do that. Um, there isn't a single organization or a single body that can actually address all of this need and the challenges of climate change. But if we can facilitate meaningful community engagement and provide people with the tools and the resources to do it, what we find is transformation and that the transformation happens immediately. Um, an example that we had that's really recent is um, the community participatory budget process in Sunset Park where we went to the local community expo and we saw all of these projects that community people had put together to for green solutions. Um, that all came out of uh, raising climate consciousness in the community. It came out of making people feel that they are the drivers of uh, of, of, uh, of, of addressing, clim uh, addressing climate change solutions, that, that the solutions to building resilience are really local. Um, 
And so it is really difficult sometimes to work with agencies and to work with um, institutions that are larger that think that that is that that they have our best interests in mind. And so part of what we do is also educate them. We follow the Hermes principles for democratic organizing that basically say, you know, be inclusive, emphasize on bottom-up organizing, let people speak for themselves, work together in solidarity and mutuality, build just relationships among ourselves, and have a commitment to self-transformation because these are the things that we think the challenges of climate change uh, will test. And so we work really hard to build principled just relationships across sectors, across interests, and we try to educate those that really have good intentions but really don't know how to step back and use their resources and expertise to facilitate a meaningful community engagement process and we provide them with those skills. We know, for example, that if you're working for a city agency and you're addressing environmental concerns that you went to work there because you care about these things. But you might not have any history or uh, a workshop on, on, on cultural competency might not do it. Um, you may not have the, the experience on how to work with communities in ways where communities are partners in decision making instead of passive recipients of your good intentions. And so we work to facilitate a process that creates that kind of power dyna dynamic, a new power dynamic that really is going to address resilience in a way that is transformational. And we believe that there's no other way of doing it. Um, that if uh, all of the responsibility and if all of the resources are put in organizations that are large or in government, then people will sort of sit back and think that their problems are going to be solved by somebody else. Um, and we know that the population is growing and that our people are in harm's way and that they have uh, the resources to do that. Another thing in terms of the cultural piece, which I think is really important, is that People who come from nations where they've had to struggle because of poverty and because of struggle have always known how to recycle, how to reuse, and how to repurpose because need has made them do that. And so we want people to be able to reclaim some of these cultural traditions that they brought to this country and, so, and teach each other how you do that, how you grow that, how you make that, how you take you know, textiles and, and reuse them. Um, so we also try to create that kind of cultural artistic space uh, where people can dig deep and go back in time and basically capture some of the stuff that made them live within their carbon footprint and make informed and, and better decisions. Um, and with the businesses, that has been a really exciting opportunity opportunity and we haven't seen transformation across the board but we've seen enough large businesses on our waterfront change their practices to believe that they will become the models for other businesses so for example with the sims recycling facility uh, they met with us early and often and they have built a facility that is carbon neutral uh, just yesterday we met with the New York City Economic Development Corporation uh, because they are working with a business that wants to come to our waterfront and they want to do recycling of brown and yellow grease on the waterfront. And we asked them questions about the number of trucks, whether the trucks had emissions, uh, whether the facility was going to be a carbon neutral facility, whether the, lot, whether the hires were going to be local, how could they ensure that the hires were local, did they know what the skill set was in the community, did that skill set that match the employees that they would be hiring, whether they would be hiring vertically and, and horizontally. And for that, what, what that means for us is that the entry level workers aren't all people of color and the management is not, that it has to be mixed up and down. Um, so we asked them all of these questions and they seemed excited uh, to be able to answer them and they, and they authentically, I think, sincerely felt that this is the right industry for the waterfront. We should be looking at um, industry that is working on building the kind of adaptation that we need for New York City's waterfront uh, instead of sort of these little boutique green shops that only hire a few people with high levels of education and then come with a second wave of gentrification. Um, so it's all complex, but it, um, it, it's been very exciting to bring all of these different kinds of people together and to agree to work in a way that is just in principle to start focusing and working and drill down on one community so that our community becomes not only a model 
of resilience, but a model that can be replicated. So thank you for the opportunity to share uh, this information with you. You can reach us at info at uprose.org. You could follow us on Twitter at Uprose, um, and we look forward to answering your questions. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Lara will just give a couple closing remarks. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, the, my three fellow presenters, Kara, Kimberly, and Elizabeth. Um, the the projects that they're working on from NWF's green works to the on the ground work in Detroit and in Brooklyn um, is is the heart of what adaptation is. Um, solutions to climate change are requiring social change, um, and that has to start with where people live. Um, there's no recipe for what um, you do to make this happen, but I think that we've certainly gotten two excellent examples of how people have started to take this on in the places where they live. Um, while there's no recipe, there is sort of a, a continuum of the things that happen, and uh, we refer to that as the adaptation ladder of engagement. Um, it's a ladder, but thank you, Whitney, you can actually keep clicking those. Um, it's not um, a linear path. Um, in fact, you can skip steps on the ladder, um, and from the talks you heard today, there were certainly examples of that. Um, you can also uh, go backwards on the ladder because there are things that teach you lessons. So in Kimberly's talk, it's very clear that they're working on the first rung of the ladder, awareness and getting the message out there and engaging with people. Um, they're doing assessments. They did um, an assessment with the University of Michigan um, they're working on their plan. Um, she talked about that they were nearing the release of that, but she couldn't share the details yet. So, Kimberly, please share that when it is a printable document and we can post it onto the webinar, um, the, the webinar uh, workspace site. Um, excellent. Um, and then that will get to the exciting point of number four, implementation, which is where we actually start doing the work on the ground. Um, one of the great things in Kimberly's talk is that she started talking about monitoring. Um, monitoring is where we actually see whether or not the things we're implementing are working. Um, and they actually had started creating the metrics for how they'll be doing that when they get to that point. Um, throughout her talk, she discussed the aspects that were integration and the aspects that were sharing. Integration being how do you make this happen across different sectors and across different aspects of work. Um, the city of Detroit is not just doing this to say, let's think about lake level drop, but instead they're thinking about what are all of the implications for Detroit? Um, how do we plan across the board? How do communities work on that? Um, in Elizabeth's example, they're actually uh, working at a variety of scales and have covered all of the rungs of the ladder. Um, although it, some of them are easier to see than others, I, I, in my interpretation, um, the block organizers, which I love the idea of, are the best version of the monitoring rung of the ladder you could possibly have. They're people who are actually living what the implications are of the actions and are giving you immediate feedback as to this isn't working, this is working. Um, so our goal is to have successful adaptation across the United States, around the world, um, include people reflecting on the fact that there are all these steps. The two cases you heard today are pretty unique in the fact that they're covering so many of the rungs of the ladder. The majority of cases we find people are getting up to step three um, and sometimes failing to actually implement the plans they work to create. Or in an even less ambitious model, a lot of people get to the assessment stage and they, yes, say we have a problem, we have assessed and uh, we know our vulnerabilities and never do anything about it. So. Um, the case studies you got today were picked because they are really showing you um, the full range of the actions that one needs to take to have successful adaptation. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things I want people to think about when they think about urban adaptation is to think about the need to do it holistically. Um, there are certainly great examples provided in the two talks today about doing holistic urban adaptation. In Detroit, they were including communities and neighborhoods, business and government. In Brooklyn, you have the intergenerational aspect and the cultural expression, as Elizabeth refers to it, um, as well as including businesses. And they work on scaling both up and down, working at the block level, working at the waterfront level, and working as part of Plan NYC. Um, that is all vital to how we do this work. If you only work at a very small scale, 
you'll be adversely affected by the other plans or other actions that are going on around you. I like to think about cities as islands. Um, I actually used to do a lot of work on real islands, and when I started working more on cities, I realized they were much the same. Um, there's a complex array of activities that go on on the islands, but islands are reliant on the surrounding space. In the case of New York, the water supply from New York comes from the Catskills upstate. Um, they're also reliant on faraway spaces for food and materials. Much of the food and the building materials that come into cities are brought in from outside. There are certainly great examples in both Brooklyn and Detroit of urban gardening efforts, um, but the bulk of what people rely upon comes in from outside. And whether you're doing emergency preparedness or you're thinking about long-term adaptation, you want to develop plans that, includes, that include all of those aspects in the same strategy so that you can avoid maladaptation and get more cost-effective action. Um, you don't want people developing a plan for agriculture um, in the areas that you're reliant on that does not include maintaining a food supply for your city. Next slide, please. Um, great ideas shared today. I want to encourage people to think about developing session ideas for urban adaptation working groups and symposia. Um, at the National Adaptation Forum in May of 2015. One more slide, Whitney. A couple more resources where you can find information that you might find useful in addition to everything that was provided today. We'll try and put links to all of this up on the webinar support page. Um, but I know that we have a bunch of questions in the queue and I want to make sure we have time for conversation. So. We'll ask some questions, but if your question doesn't get to, we don't get to your question, please um, feel free to email um, any of the participants in the call today or the call organizers, um, and we'll get information out to you and post it on the webinar support page. Alex, can you facilitate the questions? Yes, and since we are um, unfortunately running a little bit out of time, we are just going to take two questions for um, for all three of you to to um, to address, please, at this time. So one of them is, you know, to get the communities really engaged, how much climate education needs to be done prior to actually getting folks engaged um, into into um, your work and actually um, realizing that this is an important issue that needs to be addressed. And as a follow-up to that, once you get people involved, one of the things that other communities are, and cities are seeing is that um, some climate models are not specific enough to for cities, and therefore businesses want to be want to see specific cost profiles and timeframes in which um, certain um, climate impacts would uh, would affect them. So, how have you overcome that challenge with maybe not having very good forecasting for your specific community. Um, does um, Kimberly, do you want to start off and then we'll pass it on to Elizabeth and then to Lara? Okay. Um, well, one of the things that we did is we partnered with a team of scientists. And so when we put this together um, and just looking at, so we had a research team that uh, studied um, all several climate action plans. And what we realized that that is that there are phases to climate action planning. And so right now we're in the organizational and research phase because I can't go out into the community and present something. Uh, you know, you've got to have something to present. And so we did it. We uh, worked with a group of scientists to paint the picture of what climate change will look like in Detroit. And so the, these team of scientists did a climatology report with us and so or for us. And what we've done is we've had several focus groups in addition to the work groups. And so we're 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 building the case and building the information so that when we roll this out to the community um, and uh, as we're getting ready to launch a full community engagement program, uh, we will have the information that they need to make an informed decision on the recommendations that uh, the framework that will be presented, they will be able to uh, comment on the recommendations. Um, in terms of the timeline, uh, that is internal, and what we're saying is that we are, uh, that comes in terms of setting the targets and so you can go as fast as you want to or as slow as you want to. What we want is for everybody that's at our table to make a commitment to reducing their 
uh, emissions by the levels that we give them. And so uh, our climate action plan will be very comprehensive because we have so many voices at the table. And so, which that, and that's exactly the reason we brought business to the table because we believe in business to business marketing. We believe in organization to organization marketing, which is how we were able to bring General Motors to the table. One of the uh, corporate leaders said, hey, you need to have them at the table. And so that's what they've been doing. They said, oh, you need to have this one at the table. And so they've just been coming. And so we will have not only information, though, for the business community, we're going to have it for municipal government, as well as the community at large. Wonderful. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to chime in? Sure. Uh, you know, we, we work with uh, groups like RAND and Lifelines. We partner with them and with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance uh, to really take grapple with some of the complex issues um, that are affecting uh, our community. But what we do on a very local level is that uh, we are able to make the connection in a very compelling way between people's public health disparities and, and the environmental burdens that exist in the community. And most of those environmental burdens are created by uh, industries that depend on fossil fuels and so so that kind of education happens and we're very solution oriented so our, our communities are really involved in, in literally changing the landscape and once you've got folks on the ground changing the landscape it's kinda hard to disengage them after that they're hooked they know that they can they drive change and and then um, the conversations with the businesses I think are a little different the the businesses here know that um, they will be the victims of a storm surge that you know Sandy really challenged them one of them had a million gallons of water uh, that they had to take out um, and so they know that working with the community to become climate adaptable is in is in their interest it's, it's part of their survivability and their livability and so what we try to do is work with them to try to get resources so that they can become climate adaptable and they stop depending on fossil fuels um, the other thing that we've talked to our businesses about is a new economy uh, a what or their next economy that maybe we need to start thinking even from the business end although it's unheard of of really functioning with what you need and not with what you want that maybe a new economy is going to look very different uh, in the sense of um, production and what that looks like. Um, so those are new conversations, uh, but there are some businesses that are open to them. I know that uh, the folks from Uncommon Goods, uh, the, the, the CEO is unbelievable, really hires uh, locally and has business practices that are just. It's a great place for our community to work. Um, and there are some some folks that are you know that are working on the waterfront that really have a different sense of community or good sense of community and so those those are those are great opportunities uh, but from the community end um, there's nothing more powerful than a mother whose children have asthma and she gets that we can't separate um, that's where the justice frame is we can't separate uh, we can't just focus on carbon we also have to focus on co pollutants. No, wonderful. Um, there, we have had several other questions um, in this um, during the webinar. Um, what I'm going to do is work with Elizabeth and um, Kimberly in getting those answered and posting them on the website. So I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. We just are a little bit over um, time schedule right now. But Laura, do you want to give some closing remarks and then we'll end the webinar at that point? Excellent. Thanks, Alex. Um, thanks to everyone. Thanks to the 90 people who attended the webinar today, and thank you to um, my three fellow panelists, Kara, Kimberly, and Elizabeth. Um, I appreciate the time that they spent um, preparing for this and sharing information with you. Um, and I hope that you all found something useful in their presentations that you can apply to yours. The point of these webinars is to try and have uh, the, the essence of the National Adaptation Forum's sharing of information to improve all of the work that each of us does um, continue uh, over the course of the year and a half, two years between each event. Um, so hopefully you're finding these useful. If you have ideas for subsequent webinars, please send them our way. Um, if someone in a webinar brings something up and you want to do an update with them later on, we can try and get them on the docket into the future. Um, 
but uh, thank you all for your time today and more importantly, the work that each of you does on climate change adaptation out in the real world. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Do you want us to stay on the phone? Um, um, I think. Go ahead. No, it's all yours, Alex. No, oh, I just, I just put a message that I could have stayed on there longer to answer some of the uh, questions. Oh, well, I think because um, people were already logging out, Kimberly, oh, okay. um, I think it's just, yeah, I think at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, the list of questions. I think there was um, three, five specifically to you and three specifically for Elizabeth and then a couple more more generally. And if you guys would take two minutes to answer, I will put those on the website for everybody to see. Um, yeah, and some okay. of them were asking for specific um, documents that you mentioned and we can get those posted on the, um, on the, website. On the, the webinar support page and we can also um, put a link directing them to other resources on your website that you'd like people to be redirected to. Okay, I can do that. Now go to, now what website am I going to? Uh, Alex will send you an email and we'll do all the posting. She'll send you an email with the questions. You provide us the information and the links and then we'll post them on the EcoAdapt webinar support page and we'll send you a link for that as well should you want to link to it so that you have a thing to tell people I did this yesterday.